Uh, yeah, I do. I do interviews with the, the leaders in the field of brain computer interfaces. That little brief snippet was with Layden from the Neural Implant podcast. And he is the kind of not so much guest in this one, but it was more like we both kind of interviewed each other talking about some of the interesting things we've learned by making podcasts like he guests, like that type of thing. Bonus episode. So if you guys like it, I'll keep featuring other podcasters out there so you can kind of see what they're like and get a sense of them. If you like his stuff, check out the show notes. Tune in every Tuesday to the Learning with Lowell podcast with me, your host, Lowell, to hear world-class scientists, startup founders, CEOs, and authors, people who you wouldn't normally hear about but are making huge waves all the same. You'll understand them and their work by hearing their passion, laughter, advice, and hearing them, the experts, break down what they're working on so that you can learn, push the boundaries of your knowledge and understanding. Three quick ways to show your support and get unique, exclusive, and fun content is by checking out learningwithlowell.com website, our Patreon page, even if it's just a buck, it keeps us advertisement free, and subscribing. Yeah, you, you have a great show. I mean, Learning with Lowell, I, I really enjoy it. You know, like you, you kind of have a broad perspective uh, of what's going on in the, I don't know, science field and just like hot, you know, hot stuff coming down the line, you know, and, and, uh, but w- with the focus on funding and everything like this, I, I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's kind of cool. And, and I think it's kind of funny. It's like learning with all we're learning along with you. Right. <laughs> That's the idea. My, my girlfriend, I'm not good at naming things. I would have named it the road to awe, which is in relation to the fountain movie. I recommend everyone check out with Hugh Jackman. Uh, but it has a vague religious tone, so I, which was going to be about discovery. But yeah, um, my girlfriend is much better at naming things. So yeah, learning with all the ideas to get people to learn along with me. But something I'm, I'm curious about, because you, you've been doing this for, I think, a year and a half, right? Or two years? Yeah, something like that, a year and a half. Yeah. So who, what are some, what are like, like not your all-stars, because then it's like some people feel left out, but like what are some notable interviews you've done where the people just seem like really special or that you can remember right now? You know, it, it is kind of, I guess, biased in this way because uh, it, it probably is some of my first episodes. Just, and I think that was probably the most influential, just because it went from like zero to you know a thousand, and it probably is my first three. You know, Walter Voigt, Chad Bowden, and Kip Ludwig, and that's because they kind of introduced the field to me, and uh, they're they're doing really really amazing stuff. So uh, the big thing I learned actually with Kip Ludwig is about bioelectronic medicine, which is basically uh, brain impact plants, but kind of in the peripheral nerve. So, so instead of going, you know, into the brain, it goes into the rest of the body and you can control organ function with this. And, and they're just doing stuff all the time with it. And, and you can control like the pancreas, the liver. And the big thing is that you can replace pharmaceutical drugs in a lot of these cases. So that to me was completely new. And, and, you know, it's just because like, okay, this is the guy that introduced me to it, uh, that my mind was blown and literally sent me down a path of this, and now I'm kind of working in a in a lab that's that's working on this. So uh, I, I would have to say those are probably the most, but but it's not because you know they're they're amazing or more amazing than my other guests. <laughs> well, how about you? Uh, well, I, just to follow up on 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 that real quick, um, and then I'll answer your question. But the, um, how how does it regulate it? Is it kind of like a, a like an insulin pump type thing, or, or like how does it regulate the the thing? Is it only in the lab, or can they can it like they do it? as like people are in the wild, <laughs> not in the wild, but like in their daily lives. Like, how does that actually work? I'm very curious. Yeah. Yeah. In the wild, it only works in the uh, jungles of Africa. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, actually, I mean, right now it's just animal studies. Mostly. Uh, I, I don't think they're doing much uh, with humans, you know, that they're not probably to that level of technology, but uh, basically, yeah, they're just doing it on mice and rats right now, but it's, it's kind of a, a broad course way of doing things. It's not really, um, refined yet, but it's, it's still amazing. I mean, it just kind of like, you know, sends a signal through the whole nerve and, uh, then, then the right thing happens. So that everybody's just like, well, well, we had a good result. So, you know, we don't really know what happened, but, but it works somehow. So that, that's kind of the, the state that the technology is at, but it's, it's moving very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm saying like this field really got launched like three years ago, four years ago, and there's been huge advances. So it's, it's going by leaps and bounds. And like every six months, it's just like doubling pretty much. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that I've found, and I will answer your question. I'm sorry about this, but that's one of the things I found in science that I, I think is really helpful for people to understand is that everything isn't known. Like even stuff that we use every day, like anesthesia, we don't know why that works. We just use it. Like we're just like, we put this thing in here and it kind of comes out how we want it to. But I think that's one of the, I think that's a really fascinating thing about science. Like they, they work, scientists work to make known what is unknown, but it's always 
like there's always something else and, and, and a lot of things that we use every day are just not like the, the reasons the causes that the whys of how it works it's just not known and i think it's really fascinating that yeah like, for sure uh, yeah, sorry, sorry for interrupting, but no, that's exactly that's exactly it. I mean, like, um, I, I think the big the big magical thing or the big aid in this in this field is how plastic and how adaptable the brain and the body is. So I was talking to Robert Shannon at the Neural Interfaces Conference in Minneapolis in July, and he's kind of the the pioneer. He's kind of the founder of cochlear implants of this field. And uh, you know, for a while, they're just doing one electrode, they're just doing one channel. So basically, it's like having Morse code. But for all the sound in your life, you know, cochlear implants are kind of like hearing aids for people who can't hear. And, and um, you know, so, so, but people understood this and, and some could even talk on the phone with essentially Morse code for all of sound, you know, and, and so it's, it's just amazing. But it really, it's, it's not a testament how great we are, or how great our technology is. It's how adaptable our brain and our body is. So that, that's the amazing thing. Right. Like if you're, if you're young enough and you lose half your brain, it doesn't matter because we can adapt to it and we'll be more or less fully functioning but you know as you get older you're less adaptable which the only point i'm trying to make there is that like you can lose half your brain when you're young and still be fine which is crazy like i'd want to lose none of my brain <laughs> but um yeah well and, and some of people we know have been walking around with less than half a brain <laughs> yeah and you wouldn't really know like they're like the one brain just takes over like it just kind of does the role of both which but to answer your question you know like two three minutes late uh, i would say <laughs> I'd say the in 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 relation to what we're talking about, I really love what Ben Paul is doing with Neuroloom. It is it is fantastic. And the guy has a really good mindset. Like I, I like to look at the people as well as what they're building. Like I think good technology without good people behind it kinda like you get one of those uh what the Isle of Dr. Moreau, where the guy's just kinda like building evil things on an island and it's not good for people. And so he, he just has like this really good reason for why he's building what he's building, which is basically a way to interface with the optic nerve. And in a way that he describes as before, like the old way of doing it, it was like typing with your fists on a keyboard. And now with his technology, it's like using your fingers. And, you know, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a big leap. But uh, another person, but not not really in the neuro space, but he he basically is the reason that Neuroloom exists. Ben Paul exists in this space is Dom from Deep Science Ventures. That guy is built kind of like a, a Y Combinator. If people aren't familiar with the UK market. Uh, in the UK and it is fantastic like the stuff coming out of there he really has something special and then I think if I have to round it out with a third there's Leo Petraskin of Neural Analytics which has found a way to you know like a uh, heart rate monitors that you can you see basically everywhere um, not like mm -hmm. a the things where you like shock paddle people if they're having like a heart attack at the mall to like make sure their hearts like realigned a defibrillator yeah there you go thank you he his technology will be as ubiquitous as that in the sense that it's a way that if you hit your head, you can you can put this thing attached onto you and it'll tell you if you need to see, like it'll basically kind of like permeate your bone and detect what's going on in your brain and let you know if there's been damage or if you should be seeing a doctor using, like right now he has, you have to use a technician to like kind of like they do all the readouts and they'll be like, oh, okay, this is what it means. But eventually they're going to have one where it's basically like you hook it up to someone, they fell, they hit their head. They're like, yeah, you've had a mild concussion. You should go see a doctor, make sure this is okay. Or, you know, even to the extent where they can let you know when you're having a stroke and they can tell you the extent of the stroke. And like, it's like the crate in the field, which the original uh, application of it was for the military. So like ha they have a very good need for knowing when a sol shoulder a soldier has suffered some type of traumatic injury on their brain because that's where a lot of the PTSD is coming from. But they can he, he can be there before you can get him to the machine that can do like the really great imaging, he can, he can be there and you can see and detect it. But those are the three that really strand out to me without put like Ben Paul as number one, that guy's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. That sounds really, that sounds really interesting. Actually, uh, this last one, it really reminds me of what, uh, a former guest, you know, Dr. Christine Well, uh, Wella had, uh, on, you know, she, she basically had the same thing, like measuring concussions, um, you know, without an MRI, you could do it in the field. Uh, so yeah, that, that was, that's really interesting. So a lot of people are working on, I guess, similar things, uh, great minds think alike. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, something from his episode that Leo's episode that I really liked, other than the fact that the, the last half of it, he literally, he literally, oh, we we open up our monitor, like uh, the web browser, and he walks me through how to start a biotech startup, how to get funding, and how to get intellectual IP from my laptop. Wow. Yeah, so like it, it, it made, I mean, granted, there's more steps to it. Granted, it's, it's more complicated than just looking at some screens, but 
I think there's this great sense that it takes a lot. Like it takes a lot of work and this like Herculean amount, like you don't know anything for five years. And and quite frankly, even the people that I've talked with at Indie Bio, like they they're seeing that you can get you can see results within 18 months, you know, or half the time. And a lot of the startups that they've been funding have been able to do stuff like that. And then and then like the idea that you can see what's being funded. You can you can find intellectual property that's for sale in 90, I think it's 97% of all like your taxpayer dollars that are going out there and like, you know, doing research every day at, at universities, it's not being used. And it just sits there. And so the universities are like, oh, you, you want to use our IP? You want the license for it? Like, here, here you go. Like, they're so eager for this. They have they have licensing departments where the entire job is to help people use their technology. And it becomes their technology so they can build, like, it becomes like the nucleus of building a, a startup in a lot of situations. Yeah, for sure. I actually just talked to, uh, I mean, well, just talked to like a month or two ago, I talked to exactly this, the the technology spinoff, you know, department of, of the University of Florida. And, and yeah, they have many, many, you know, intellectual property, like just patents just sitting around because, you know, professors, they don't want to quit their job and they don't want to like spend thousands of hours, you know, following a project if, if, you know, they have other things on their plate. So uh, it really is there. I mean, it's, it's very easy to license something and, and they're really happy to do it. And then a lot of times if, if you're a student or maybe even not, like they, they would help out with it, you know, in the beginning stages, I mean, they would of course take a cut, but it'd be essentially like having a, an angel investor or a VC or something like this right out, you know, right out the gate. And uh, it's, it's kind of a underutilized, um, you know, piece of information, underutilized thing. And, and, you know, kind of me as an entre- entrepreneur, like an aspiring entrepreneur, I'm just like, oh, I want to do this. But at the same time, uh, you know, I want to develop my own thing, I guess. But but it definitely is a, a possibility. I've, I've heard about, you know, great things. Like literally somebody came up to came up to them and be like, okay, what's the most promising technology and what's the most ready, you know, ready to market? And they're just like, oh, this one, there's like these uh, self-cleaning, you know, uh, IV connectors or something like this. And then just some small, like little plastic thing. And, you know, the, the, the they use in the hospital and, uh, yeah, you know, within a year they, they were, you know, generating hundred K hundred K per year and, and, uh, in, in revenue. And, and, uh, so it's kind of, it starts slowly, but if you, yeah, if you, if you want to do this entrepreneurial path, build something of your own, then, then that's definitely the way to do it. Mm-hmm. I think one of the guests I had on my podcast, or maybe off the podcast, I talked to a lot of science people. They said that, there's enough things going on in the biotech spaces and the science spaces where pretty much everyone on the planet could pick a topic and it would be completely different to anyone else's topic and no one would ever really touch elbows because there's just so many interesting things going on. And like a great deal of them could become quite profitable, even beyond the value of you know really changing the world for the better, which that's what attracts me to the biotech and science spaces is that like when when you work really hard and what you work on comes through, and in a normal startup or in a biotech science related one, a normal startup, they just make a lot of money. You know, they make a new app and maybe it's helpful. Like it makes it easier to connect with your friends, you know, what have you. But if you get it right with a science related thing, you change someone's life like in a meaningful way. You know, Ben Paul is going to give people the ability to see again or a greater ability to see again. And other implant technology like cochlear implants give people the ability to hear. And that's different than just making you know as an example an app which apps are good too like i I definitely see the value of them but i think there's like people talk a lot about return on investment and for me i don't think there could be a greater return on investment than meaningfully changing the ways and improving someone's life and yeah i think that's probably why you're you're you know you're developing what you're working on is that you want to change people's lives as well yeah, I mean, I, I kind of thumb my nose at, you know, I guess Silicon Valley a little bit because of the, their app focused, you know, way of looking at things because, you know, how how useful, I mean, even Instagram, like, okay, it, it does it does affect billions of people, but but how useful is that? Or, you know, let, let's do an extreme example of like Facebook for dogs. And, you know, how, how useful is that? How, I mean, it's cute, but but is it really helping something? And is, it, is it really making the world a better place? Um that, that's kind of what I'm thinking, and then and then with that stuff too, like it it it's so ephemeral, you know, it it goes in and out, you know, so it, it will it will probably be gone in like two years. Versus a lot of these medical devices and and all this kind of stuff, that's going to be around for decades, and and you know you don't get that with companies now nowadays. Like any most companies don't don't stay around for decades, so that that's kind of that's kind of why I like it, and, and of course helping people. <laughs> yeah, the people. But is it is there really a Facebook for dogs? I've heard about that. I mean, I've, I've heard that it was pitched at, at least a few times. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> they're gonna get money. There was there was a there was a startup in Silicon Valley 
that got something like $200 million and it didn't work out. They didn't talk to their customers at all. So no one wanted to buy it. So they spent $200, $200 million building something that no one wanted. Well, <laughs> yeah, you would think uh, the people who gave them $200 million would do their due diligence and be like, should we give them $200 million? <laughs> it was probably the echo chamber effect where like yeah. one person barks and then everyone else hears barking and they're like, oh, we don't want to miss out on the barking until they all get in on it. Yeah, that's true. Like, ooh, this this big person got in on it. Oh, I want to also. Well, it's like, have you read the book Bad Blood? Uh, no, I haven't. I, I love I love, uh, I love your book recommendations, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I try to read a book a day sometimes it's like a book every other day but like um they're only like 200 pages so i don't know how long it should take you to read that but the the bad bad blood was i believe unless i'm thinking of a different book about not thermo fisher that's a good company it's about a lady who built a startup who kind of emulated steve jobs and how she dressed and like stared at people a little bit and it was like with a droplet of blood they would be able to do a bunch of tests but like she it wasn't deliverable but like on her board, she had like Kissinger and all these important people because she was able to like, you know, persuade them. But at the end of the day, like her her company, it went from like being an $8 billion valued company to, you know, bankruptcy. And now she's in trouble. Yeah, this is uh, Elizabeth Holmes and yeah. Theranos. Uh, yeah, this has been huge, especially this year, like earlier, <laughs> I, I think like in April, May, June, something like this. That, that's when I heard about it. And it was it was huge. So uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, crazy stuff. But I'll definitely I'll definitely read this book because it's it's uh, sounds very interesting. Yeah, it's basically the reporter and how he like sussed it out, which is interesting in and of itself. Another really interesting book, other than the Wooly book about Ben, about George Church and bringing back the Wooly Mammoth would be a Kraken Creation by Dr. Duwadna. Really interesting book. Like it really, like it starts with her surfing. You know, I, I just love that. Like a lot of people, when they think of scientists, they think, oh, I'm going to, they're in a lab, they have lab coats. Maybe there's lightning striking behind them if they're evil scientists. And really those scientists are engineers, by the way, like scientists don't, wouldn't do that. There's no control variable. But her book, I, I really like it for how she walks through how they went about creating CRISPR or really discovering CRISPR because it was just a, na a natural process in, in, in nature. Um, that's a, another book I'd definitely recommend. Yeah, that's uh, really cool. I've, I've put both of those in uh, both, both samples in my, in my Kindle. Um, by the way, back, back to the bad blood, uh, it says here on, on Amazon now to be adapted into a film with Jennifer Lawrence to star. So um, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Wooly's been made into a movie as well. It was, uh, it was picked up before it was even done writing, being written. Wow. Yeah, it's gonna be like the our it's gonna be our generation's Jurassic Park, but it's a good Jurassic Park because there's you know environmental factors and a lot of a lot of geneticists nowadays like the the world leading ones they they got their start from Jurassic Park like they were like oh this is really interesting and they're like yeah okay and then they got into it you know like I always think it's interesting like where the where like the first catalyst comes from because one of the one of the things that got me interested in psychology and I try not to tell people this because they they usually have a very bad reaction to it what was it was because of watching the movie Silence of the Lambs because I was I was intrigued by the idea that someone could have a really good understanding of another person to the point where they could like pro profile them. And now Hannibal, he had a great understanding. He, he was very twisted on how he used it. But I was intrigued by, the, by that idea of like there was a way to study the brain. And then I just wanted I just like completely dived into it after that. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, so so I guess what is what is your uh, aims with with the podcast? Like, what you're you're learning with Lowell, and I, I think it's kind of funny because we're learning with you. But uh, what what is your goals with learning with Lowell? Well, I kind of think the best way to understand it is to kind of see why I made it, which is a similar question, but not the same question. And the basically, it started several years ago while I was in the hospital for an undiagnosed illness, and basically every week I was in in and out of like the ICU, not every week, but you know more than you should in a lifetime. And I had a nurse, just to give an example, how like the ICU is not a place you should want to go to. Uh, I had a nurse that when I woke up for the first time there was really happy. And it's like, oh, you know, you want your nurse to be happy. But I, after teasing it out on, a, you know, several conversations, she let it be known to me that over the, over the course of 20 years of being an ICU nurse, I'm the first person to leave alive. And so like the ICU is not the place you want to go to hang out. So like I was in there quite often, but it took, a, it took a while, but I met. I eventually found a good diagnosis and a drug treatment that would make me better. And I flew out to meet the people who made the drug. 
and they were they all like this great passion basically what we've been talking about this entire time like this meaningful desire to create value and, and, and change people's lives and in this case it saved my life i would have died without it and and so they had this, this crazy amount of passion and so ever since then i've been looking for ways to get people not only inspired but showing the scientists that are building stuff every day that aren't getting the respect or the appreciation they're, they're, they're due. And, and in the news, you either hear about the scientists that are hyping their work too much, and so it's kind of biased, or you're hearing about failures. But you never hear about the people working every day to make all of our lives better. And so that's like every why of each episode is to kind of inspire, show you a different person's life, show you the life of a scientist, and kind of show how you can do the same. Because we basically talk about what, what people are passionate about. And, and passion... Like when I hear someone talk about passion, it could be anything. You, you you know, a kid comes up to me or anyone comes up to me and starts talking about their passion for baseball. I don't like baseball. You know, I'm an American, but like baseball is like our, our pastime. It's not something that interests me, but I'll listen to someone who has a passion for baseball and they talk about the statistics and what they love about it. And it's the same thing with my podcast with these scientists. Like you may not understand neural engineering, but when you talk about Ben, when you listen to Ben Paul talk about why he loves neural engineering, you're going to want to learn more. And that's really why I made the podcast, because I think there's a hunger in America for pe- for science. But then it's how do you get people, how do you get the science to people in a way where you can still hear the passion, where it's not just at 2015, I published a paper that showed that there was a 30, 37% uh, you know, variable on, you know, whatever. It's like just math and, and science at a certain point. And you lose the human element, which is saving lives or making a life different. But that's that's the why and that's the where, I suppose, into your question. But what about you? What was your goal? I mean, yeah, I, I guess I'll add to that. Like, uh, you know, you, you're a fan of genetics, and and it gets really crazy with genetics, like with some of the the protein names and everything like this. And it's like the NT uh, NTQRF five gene, you know, <laughs> upregulates this, and then the N, NTSS pp763 you know and it's just like is this is this like did a cat just walk on the keyboard or, or what's going on and so yeah it, it's kind of a um, inhuman way of doing things and and i guess yeah that is that is why i i started mine as well like um you know i, I actually did it to get a job you know and and uh, to find uh, you know i so i had applied for some phds and i wanted to make sure that i applied to the right one and uh you know with with my i don't know interests in aligned and everything like this and and what i was kind of running into was was they're like okay well we don't really care about your idea uh we want you to work on our idea which you know of course makes sense but but uh you know i'm, I'm like no i don't want to i, I want to do my idea or i want to do at least some version of my idea and so so yeah i was basically doing this to uh get in contact find out like what does the the you know environment look like and uh talk to talk to a lot of people and and see who gets me the most excited and and um that that is and then another thing too like scientific papers are uh you know owned by journals and they're often behind paywalls and and you might have to pay like fifty dollars for one article which is you know eight pages or three hundred dollars for access to the whole journal so uh, I'm just like uh, I'll just talk to the person who did the research themselves and and the beautiful thing about podcasting you know besides of course that I had experience with it is that it's you can't really complicate things too much because with YouTube and videos, you can, you know, show the NTGR5 gene or whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it can still be kind of complicated and, and inhuman, and especially writing, you know, that, that's that's the one where you can do the most complicated. But if it's just a conversation, you know, there's no visual aids. So you have to explain it very, very simply because I won't understand it. You know, I won't be able to follow you. Nobody would be able to follow you. So you you kind of speak in a human language. And that that's what I really like. And and now that that's what my audience is really liked is uh, you know the being able to speak in a human language because this stuff is not hard it's it's really not it's not difficult as well uh, at all like like you can I, I think if you can't explain it simply then you don't understand it and so if you can't explain it to a 10 year old then you don't understand what you're doing <laughs> and so that, that that's kind of what I try to do and and uh, with that goal you know the the getting a job it, it is kind of mission accomplished I, I found a, a great lab here in University of Florida and in a lab that I think um, is interested in my ideas and is has the capability of of you know doing my ideas and also their stuff is really 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 cool. So I'm I'm excited on all fronts, and, and the the workmates are great, and I've really loved to, grown to love Florida. So um, you know it's kind of mission accomplished. So now I guess the next mission is to bring the community together and just know what everybody's doing like all the time, and get even more people in the field in a very low friction way, like a very easy way. Like how do you get an 18 year old or 20 year old just trying to decide you know what they want to do in their life? Uh, how do you get them in? And it's just like uh, yeah, reading 50 scientific papers, which will probably take you a few weeks 
is probably not the right answer. And especially if they're, you know, entertaining multiple options. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's my show. <laughs> so, uh, to the, the, something funny about what you said in the beginning, when you were like listing jeans and, you know, did a cat run on it. I could not tell if you were joking or not. Those could literally have been jeans. <laughs> like that's, that's the funny thing about genetics. Like it is, I don't know if those were like legit things that you read and like, oh, the TP blah, 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 blah is an actual gene that you're researching. But like, you can't really tell, like, especially when you're reading it in the research, like it's, it's a, it's a kind of a world in, unto itself. And, and a lot of, a lot of articles um, in, in, in journals, they're, they're not really made for people, not general people or, or people looking to make a decision. They're made for scientists to learn about what other scientists are doing to say current. It's not like they, we spend we spend billions of dollars a year to create science that's really only good for other scientists and it, and then it's kind of like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy a little bit of you know keeping those scientists well fed but then you know, what about the people that are like on the like right on the fence of you know i want to do science but i don't know how like how do you get them and you know exactly what you're saying and i think i think there's two quotes that really like bring out this concept of like getting people into the sciences or or helping them make that decision which is like there's two great Benjamin Franklin quotes. They might be Benjamin Franklin that, you know, sometimes they're misattributed on the internet, but I'm pretty sure they are because I read his biography and he, and, he, and he referenced one of them. But there's the greatest repository of knowledge and innovation isn't found in the library. And if you update it, it would be, you know, the internet. It wouldn't be in either of those things. It would be in the grave because so many people don't take their shot or they're discouraged or people, you know, life happens and they just keep going down the line and the line, line and then they're dead. And then they aren't able to make their con contribution to society and innovate or help in the innovation. And we all would have been better for it. Like, the world would be better if everyone worked on what they like uh, worked when they had these innovations to make them happen. And then the second one is a lot of people die at 25 and are buried 40 or 50 years later. And and what that means is people stop trying. They settle. They take a job that they know they don't want, and they know they shouldn't be in this job. And they're at 31, and they're like. I want to be in the sciences. I want to do, you know, there's a, there was a researcher on my podcast who, if I'm remembering the right one, she did not specialize in penguins the first time she went to college. She went back to college either in the early thirties or early forties, got that specialization. And you think, oh, she's probably too far behind. She's not able to do meaningful work. She is called the penguin expert. She literally does Ted talks. Now she goes to the, to, and hangs out with penguins. She saved thousands of penguins lives. Like the world is different because she took that shot and be because she did it in a, in a logical way. So she wasn't kind of like putting her head on the chopping block, which is like, you know, getting $300,000 in debt for something that maybe not be profitable. is like something to be mindful of. But if in her case, she was very mindful of it. She was very much about the passion of it. And that's why she did it. And she was able to actually make a meaningful contribution. And I think that's, that's kind of what both our podcast is about is like getting people off the fence and seeing what they're doing so that they don't, take that innovation with them to the to the grave like all these ideas you had as you told people about they're like no we want you to do our ideas and granted it's it is good to gain skills from helping other people on their projects so you can build your own even better but imagine if you just like sublimated yourself into those projects then you bottlenecked yourself in and then you know you know you maybe even forgot why you were even interested in those ideas in the beginning in the, in the first place and then you never make those innovation and then we're all poor for it i, I don't know what your innovations are but i i imagine that only you could do them like you would do them because you're the only, you know, you that exists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think so too. Like I, more, more that it wouldn't, I, I probably would still be able to do those ideas, but, but I'm, I'm kind of more worried that it would send me down the wrong path, like the wrong direction. Like I wanted to go, I wanted to go North and actually now I'm going West. And maybe by the time I, I realize like what's happened, then, then I'm completely different in a different place. But, but, um, I mean, that, that could be useful. Maybe that could have been good because, you know, like with this, uh, penguin, uh, penguin lady example, uh, it, it kind of is the, the combination of skills and with a combination of skills, you, you can become the best person in the world, like, like whatever she was doing before, let's say it was like, I don't know, software programming or accounting or something like this, and then penguins. And then you bring those two skills together. You might be the only, you know, software programmer penguin person there. And, uh, so it, it is kind of, it is kind of amazing. And that, that's, you know, what I like about what I'm doing too, is, is, uh, I'm the only <laughs> uh, brain implant podcaster, you know, and, and therefore I'm the best. <laughs> well, it's, it's like only in hindsight, do you realize how valuable these things are innovations where you take two or more things that are seemingly unrelated and combine them in a new way like that's it like you don't have to build an entirely new widget 
you just take tractor, internet, and robots, and now you have something that mows your lawn for you. You know, that's an innovation, um, which is interesting that it, it, it is really as simple as that. Like it, it, I think sometimes people kind of build it up to be like, oh, I can't innovate. And it's like, I, I guarantee as you're driving home from work or the last time you had something that, you know, makes you angry, you thought of a different way of doing it. After you got through the anger, you were like, oh, I wonder how you could do this differently. Or, you know, there's like a thousand different ways of doing it. Like some people like couponing <laughs> as a simple way. And they like use coupons in a way that the stores probably didn't expect. And you save a lot of money, which is great for you. But I, it, there's a, an example of someone that only in hindsight do you realize that their entire life was building to be meaningful. And it's Teddy Roosevelt. When he was a kid, Teddy Roosevelt had asthma and he almost died a bunch of times. And it made him really physical. Like he worked out when he could work out, like he took his body really seriously. And he became like when he was president, he actually went blind in one eye because he had a boxing match in the in the White House. And I don't think he lost. But at the same time, he did go like he detached his retina. And and like in his life, you see these moments where, you know, basically being sick and then have, having to like work through that and having that iron will determination to like be physical had had made him different his entire life. And 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 in fact, like I think Teddy Roosevelt on a number of occasions basically stopped world wars from breaking out because he knew how to, you know, be physical, you know, be, you know, that as the, the saying goes, speak softly and carry a big stick because he, he knows the value of you know taking care of the things you can physically, but then being really smart about how you apply your resources. And he's always had to be really scarce with them. But only in hindsight, do you see that that made him an effective president? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's everybody's background, you know, comes into play, and and it's, uh, you know, we don't know how it'll how it'll work out or how it'll, you know, combine and if it will be a good combination. But yeah, it's all these examples have been really very much so like like it's not one person who did one thing their whole life. It's not like okay, I'm doing software programming my whole life and I'm never going to do anything else, never going to touch anything else. It's um, you know, being able to see get inspiration from different places. And, and uh, that's actually, I mean, you know, before, before we, we started recording, I, I was talking about this, like, yeah, you know, I have this idea and it's, it's based on, or it's inspired by Eastern medicine. And, you know, the, I think there's a lot of stuff to be taken from Eastern medicine in the field of brain implants. And it's a little, it, it's, it's taking these two things and putting them together, like, like a field that's been around for 4,000 years. I don't even know, 6,000 years or something like this. And, uh, you know, putting it together with this field that's been around for 20 years. And there, I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to be learned. So, and it's easy. It's literally, it's, it's, it's almost plagiarism, honestly. <laughs> well, as, as the saying goes, you only see far by standing on the shoulders of giants or on the shoulders of the people who come, who came before you. And yeah. actually, I actually have a, I have a question for you. Do you have any, do you have any like keystone or like interesting questions you like asking people or like, yeah. Yeah. So I, I like asking about, you know, the, the people's challenges and, um, you know, one, one that I kind of like asking now, especially to academics and I guess, I guess to business people as well is if you had unlimited funding, what would you do? And, you know, that, that's kind of, that kind of reframes everything because, you know, everybody's, everybody wants to just get the next round of funding. But, but like, if you had unlimited resources, first of all, I mean, to be in that position is just like, well, what do you do? You know, and, and that, that really opens things up. So that's, that's kind of my favorite question, but I've honestly, I've honestly only started that recently. Like, <laughs> I think uh, only a few months ago, a few shows ago. So uh, I, I haven't asked that uh, of a lot of people. But but how about you? Well, this is actually one that I've, I I am recent as well. This is like my favorite one that I'm gonna try and leave each episode with because it's just like you get so much from it. But it came from when I was talking with uh, George Church in regard to a series I'm doing on longevity, where I research all the scientists on it. And and so at the end of the episodes with like the new ones I've done, I, I asked people if you could give longevity, like the the perfect form of it that people are working on, to three people, and it can't be you or a loved one. What who would be those three people and why? You know, and I give the example like imagine Einstein, you gave it to him, you know, past and past to present, anyone as long as it's not you or a loved one. And I and I give the example of you know imagine I you know give it to Einstein, he's still alive. Imagine what we'd have our understanding of the universe would be because that guy was just a beast uh, of 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 thinking. And so I'd, I'd ask you the same question. If you could, if you could give essentially, we'll call, we'll call it uh, rejuvenation to anyone past or present that isn't a loved one, who would it be and why? Uh, I mean, I, I've become kind of a, a fan of, I think his name is John von Neumann. Uh, he's kind of regarded as the smartest person um, who's ever lived. And, and he, you know, spoke like seven languages, was incredibly good with math. And he was on the the Manhattan Project and everything like this. And everybody was completely um, in love with him, you know, like really very, very smart guy. So uh, it'd probably be him. 
uh but also oh man who is a uh, uh oh yeah uh Feynman uh Feynman Richard uh Feynman. Richard Feynman yeah he's He's just so like reading his books. He's just so cool and so humble. And he's like, oh yeah. Also, he's like super smart, but he's just so quirky. I'm just like, that's exactly the kind of person I would want to be around. That's that's what we need more of in this world. So um, yeah, I guess I guess one of those two. Did did you say one person or, or I, it'd probably be between it be between one of those people. But both, it's kind of funny, kind of ironic that both were on the Manhattan Project. Oh right, yeah, uh, three people. So you get one more. Ah, three people. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I I don't really know um you know some pr- people that are really wise well I, I guess i guess a friend of mine um that that i really like and and you know he's kind of unknown well he is is pretty known like his name is mike bound and he's the most traveled man in the world and so he's traveled around the world for like 24 years and and he's also like a big physics nut so he really follows on uh follows up on on the big you know things the the big news in the day uh so so he's very you know literate and very very you know up to date on on science but he's also been to every country in the world and has traveled for the last like 25 years so he's very knowledgeable on two fronts so uh i guess i guess uh that's that's the person that I've interacted with the most that I, I respect their opinion the most. And, and I guess for that reason, but that's, that's honestly just because it, I was kind of put on the spot, but uh, yeah. So, so how about you? Who's your three people? Um, yeah, no, it's kind of like your favorite book, you know, like uh, it's, it's all good. If, if you don't list like one of them, that is like your favorite. But <laughs> And then you remember one like a week later and just like, Oh man, I forgot that, that, that one actually is number one. <laughs> so, all right. So I would, I would pick, I think Einstein, but it's like almost world breaking. Like you shouldn't be able to pick Einstein. That guy, he had two, he was like plugged in. He was like Neo in the matrix. Like that guy knew too much. Like it took, it took people. I think people are still unpacking things that he came up with because of how integral they were. And he was trying to unify it and do all these things. I think if, I think if you give it to Einstein, which would kind of be like a cheat code, like you really shouldn't be able to to answer that. But I think Einstein is definitely one of the people you have to, like I would go with. Because our understanding of the universe would be so different. That guy, he had like a powerhouse in between his ears. Um, yeah, I, I agree that that is kind of a cop out answer. It's like, oh yeah, Jesus, Buddha, Einstein, Mickey Mouse, all, all those, all, <laughs> all those. <laughs> well, I mean, it wouldn't help much if you gave Jesus rejuvenation, but um, that's true. That's true. <laughs> like, you know, but I, we won't go there. So, um, but the, but uh, I think George Church, I really respect and like what he's been working on, and he's. He's he said on numerous occasions that he basically will never stop. Like he will always keep pushing and helping people build things or encouraging people and training people. And 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 that's a good thing. Like he doesn't just sit in a tower and do science. Like he he'll help start startups. He'll help start businesses. He'll, he's an advisor, like a science advisor to I don't even know how many companies. Probably like twenty of them. And so he, he's really big on not just having good science, but like ap- applying good science. And I, I love that. Because a lot of times I think science stays behind a wall, you know, like we m- mentioned earlier, like a paywall. And it's like, well, you know, who's benefiting? And the second one, just thinking current affairs would have to be Bob Langer. I think there was a study that was done that there there's something like a billion people that exist today that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that guy because of the innovations and the research he's done. And that's, you know, people out of Boston. So I probably should geographically dis- um, disperse it a little bit. But who would be the last one? Hmm. Because I can't, yeah, you can't do Einstein. Like, it's too cheating. It's like, it's like Neo exists again. Well, I definitely like those two. Um, yeah, the third one is hard, huh? <laughs> yeah, right? It's like, there's so many great people. But, like, immortality, to to grant it to them? Yeah, that's a, that's a big gift. <laughs> well, it's also a curse as well. That's the thing. Like, living for a very long time is also, like, it's a responsibility. But all these people that we have named, it's a responsibility to live that long. Because the assumption is they continue to do what they're doing. That they continue to innovate and build you know for hundreds of years so it's, it's, a, it's a great responsibility so it's like i wouldn't give it to leonardo da vinci because that you know he did not share his work we only know about it because Raphael, his his apprentice kept it all in his his attic and then that guy's son basically sold it all to these people and then people started learning about it like he was very not well known like there's leonardo da vinci is just like the great thing about Leonardo da Vinci is like he had like a super brain, but he kept it to himself due to the the time of the era. So I I wouldn't give him that ability because then it's like he's not really going to do anything with it. I'd say Archimedes. I think it'd be crazy to see what he would do. He's like he was like a like a Bob Langer for the ancient world. Hmm. Interesting. Well, like when I think it was Greece or Rome, someone was conquering his town and he made war engines and stuff like that. But he actually like 
you know, granted, Leon da Vinci did build war engines and, and uh, things, but I, I, he was just too selfish about it. Like he kept it all to himself. But Archimedes, when he was being captured, the general said, bring me Archimedes like respectfully because he wanted he was going to be like, hey, you're going to work for me now. The the soldier who like the team that came up to like grab him, they were like, all right, come on with us. And, and Archimedes was like, no, I'm not done yet. Come back later. And apparently he pissed him off so much that the soldier killed him. And it, it, it's like I cannot imagine that discussion after like when that soldier went back to his general and was like yeah the, he slipped on the knife i swear you know like i bet that guy got in, like some deep deep crap but i i think it'd be exciting to see what would happen to him if he could keep going for a very long time yeah for sure i think i think actually the quote was uh, apparently he said like leave me to my circles <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah so those are my three but the, the funness of the, that question is you get, like the last time i asked it the person basically referenced three people in medical device technology that I had no idea. One of them being over 90 years old that's still innovating in, in medical device technologies. And it's like, you you see a little bit of what that person pays attention to. You know, it's 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 almost like, what's your favorite book? But instead, it's, who are your favorite people? Who, who, who are people that you think would be great if they lived longer and could make a bigger impact on the world? And then these people probably have a lot of things about them, like the people we've talked about. You can look any of them up and have books. You know, there's a, an Einstein book written by Walter Isaacson that's fantastic. You know, if you wanted to learn more about Einstein, he also wrote one, one about Leonardo da Vinci, which also is very good. You know, like there's there's so much more you can learn just from like these types of recommendations. Yeah, yeah, I, I think those uh, those Isaacson books are, are on my list, and uh, gonna gonna get through them one day. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, definitely definitely, uh, it, it is it is kind of a litmus test on you know seeing who and what is important in your life. So um, you know, maybe one day I'll have you know some neural implant people that i'm like okay i want to give them immortality because they're doing great work but but um yeah i don't know <laughs> have you read old man's war by john scalzi no i haven't oh you're gonna have to get on this the uh the people from pa paradromics that you interviewed as well and i recently just put an episode with them we talked about it in that up in the episode where in old man's war they have something called a brain pal that goes inside your brain and like hooks everything up and so you have like the internet in your head but it's not connected outside for the most part but it is connected but it, you know when you're fighting people it you know like you don't want to get like droned in but um i think that's interesting and i think old man's war especially if you like if you like implant technology i think that's something that you you'd probably enjoy because they have a lot of like really interesting stuff and there's a there's a bunch of books in the series there's probably like seven of them now it's really well written i old man's war is really great it's being made into a tv series that's really cool yeah i'll yeah. have to check that out and, it, and it's not non-fiction so it's it's not like the basic premise is a old people go to war in space. Now, how do they do that? Like Earth is basically a feeder colony for an like a for a government of humans that like have built an interstellar nationality, like whatever. And like Earth is kept purposely primitive. So like there's always a population of people and recruits. And yeah, hmm. it's very weird. It's very interesting. I like it. Interesting. Yeah. You'll have to check it out. Yeah, well, you can check it out with that Libby app I was telling you about. You know, you know save some money. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if we talked about this while we were recording. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, okay. So everyone out there, I, I read like a, I read too much. But so we were talking before and he was talking about how like, you know, you know, you know, budgets and, you know, you just don't want to spend a lot of money on things in a lot of situations. But Libby is, you go, go get a library card. It's really easy. You take your mail from your current address. You go to the library, you, you get it. If you don't have mail with your name on it, Go to the library and have them postcard you it. it. It's free. So you take this library card and you get the the Libby app and it can be on your PC, phone, what have you. I have mine on my phone. And you hook it up and you get all of their ebooks to your phone. So imagine having Amazon Unlimited or whatever it is where you get the ebooks for like a monthly subscription. I think that's what it is. But you get it for free. It's all free. And it all exists. And so there's millions and millions of free ebooks that you can check out. And it's like, oh, you check it out for like 20 days, but it's like, who cares, right? You can recheck it out if you want to read it for longer or for short or what have you. And it's really fantastic. I, I, I've probably saved like $10,000 doing it this way. Dang, that's really cool. Well, and the, and the great thing is like, instead of like torrenting or, or what have you, the the content creators who have made this, they still get something for, for this. Like the, the, the libraries pay for this, the ability to use these things. So it still sees its way back to the authors, which is still great because sometimes it's like you don't have the money, but you also still want to be supportive. So like this kind of is being supportive. Like it's more supportive than torrenting. So it's like more more uh morally appropriate 
and you won't get viruses. So that's kind of nice. That's yeah, that's really cool. So I'm going to check this out. I'm going to definitely um, make sure I'm in on this because because yeah, I mean, you know, right now I'm, I'm not spending so much on I, I used to, like I said, you know, I used to do 100 books in a year, but now it's it's like 40, something like this. So it's still, you know, per year, I guess that is something like, yeah, $400. So it's it's not insignificant. And um, so yeah, this will this will this will definitely be nice. So I'll be able to send you what's $400. I don't know. <laughs> um, some kind of scooter or something like this. I don't know. <laughs> um, Isn't four hundred dollars forty thousand dollars compounded over twenty years? That's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in twenty years, you can expect a uh, a Tesla car for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, do you want to talk about your show where you, where people can find you and um, yeah, where, where you're where you're to be found on the interwebs? On the interwebs. Well, on the Timmy Computer Network, and that's if anyone ever ever watched the Fair of the Odd Parents growing up, there might be a reference that doesn't fly with anyone but on the internet you can find me at learningwithlowell.com and it's learning with and then my name lowell l-o-w-e-l-l.com and you can find me literally anywhere on the internet when it comes to podcasts i'm on all of them and i think i might even be on spotify now so like anywhere you can listen to it itunes google tunalin stitcher if your phone connects to the internet or if your device connects to the internet you'll be able to hear my voice and as you heard today it's kind of nice <laughs> sometimes <laughs> but more importantly you get to hear a lot about Guess and there's been 50 episodes so far. I'm doing, like I said, uh, uh, a series on longevity where I have all the scientists pretty much in the industry coming on to talk about it. I'm doing a, a series on citrus greening where it's citrus like oranges as to give an example that hits home to you. 80% of the oranges in Florida have been wiped out for citrus greening. It's like the blight from Interstellar. And so that's like, we're going to do a series on that. And another one on antimicrobials. So you got 50 episodes of people building great stuff that are just science, maybe just scientists like penguin experts to people who have started startups and you kind of learn about their journey to soon really great content that it'll be more like a radio lab or a Freakonomics types episode if you're into that. But, but what about you? Where, where can people find you? Wow. That sounds really cool. First of all. Um, yeah. So neural implant podcast, uh, you know, subscribe. I'm also on like all the things probably iHeartRadio or whatever, like Stitcher, iTunes, of course. Um, yeah. So just neural implant podcast, neural implant podcast.com. I think you can listen there too. And, uh, yeah, I do, I do interviews with the, the leaders in the field of brain computer interfaces. And my personal interest is the bioelectronic medicine that we uh, talked about before a little bit and peripheral nerve implants and this kind of stuff. But, but basically I, I try to hit everything. Um, it's, it's really, really cool stuff and it's, it's kind of exploding right now. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. And, and eventually I want to, uh, do a documentary. So kind of, uh, ra radio lab style, uh, episode, but with video and only once. <laughs> Are you familiar with, well, first of all, I should probably specify that everything that I talk about on my podcast is like biotech or science related. I, I don't think I specified that. But um, the are you familiar with the National Geographic grants that they give to people who are trying to start something for the first time? It's like three to $5,000. Oh, no, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm going to apply for one as well. <laughs> oh, cool. So yeah, the, I think they're like the deadline's coming up pretty soon. So I'd apply. Oh. Um, I'll make a note to... No, uh, I'll do it after this. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Nagio, they do a lot of great stuff where like there's some that are specifically designed to someone who hasn't done anything before. So they could help support your 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 documentary. And then it gets on their platform, which is a, a double bonus because then you could say you made something for Nagio, which is fantastic yeah. or supported by Nagio, which is equally as good. And then, yeah, that's save, really save cool. Yeah. Money. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's called an early career grant, and they're typically funded from five to ten thousand dollars. So, um, yeah, that's really cool. I think I'll, I think I'll apply. Did you just pull that up? How did you know? You went from like not knowing to knowing that in like a minute. Did you pull that up? <laughs> I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like, geez, were you like pretending to like got to explain it for the viewer? Like that's really smart. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. Well, for for people who are listening today and are like, hey, this guy's really smart. Just imagine he's going to be talking to people even smarter than him. So like you're going to get different perspectives, different passions, and you're going to be able to hear this person talk about his passions in relations to their stuff as well. So it's going to be a really fantastic stuff. If you want to check his his uh, website and, you know, all those links will be in the show notes. Like they'll be like specially noted. You'll be able to click them and make it really nice and easy for you to check out all of his content. And yeah, so I like to make it easier for people to, to find you. It'll be really easy. Excellent. Keep it simple. Uh, I'm, I'm an engineer. We, we do the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like sometimes it's it's like, how do you spell Lowell, right? Or how do you spell neural implant? In, in, implant? But yeah, you can find it in the show notes if you're worried. So that way you can, you know, 
Yeah. But is there, do you, is there like a typical way that you end a podcast or is this it? Uh, yeah. Usually I go. Really? <laughs> I can do it with you. So we're, we're on the same page. Okay. Sounds good. Really? Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's serious, cool. but if it is, that's funny either way. <laughs> I, I, I should start doing that actually. <laughs> yeah. Leave it in. Uh, who cares? That was Layden from the Neural Implant Podcast. If you Google it or check the show notes, it'll pop right up. He's been podcasting for uh, some time now, and he's got a lot of content, and he's very specialized in what he's looking at. So if that type of thing interests you, jump on over and check him out. Other than that, I want to inform people before we go that there is a new way to show support for the podcast and to keep it advertisement free from now until forever, which is called Patreon. If you go to Patreon and look for Learning with Lowell, you'll see this podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell was here, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.